Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us here on Facebook and on YouTube. Coming up, your brain and food. Sometimes you bite into something and you think it tastes good and your brain, it just lights up like a Christmas tree. Well, why is that? We'll be speaking with someone who just published a study about the pleasure centers of the brain and how they, in fact, do react to food. Dr. Hanna Kaliova is here with that new study. Dr. Kaliova, this is a really interesting one. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Chuck. And if you are, in fact, hooked on food and overeating is a problem, well, how can you kick that junk food overeating habit with seven tips for detoxing your diet? Dr. Jazz, Dr. Jazz Sardana is in the house. Dr. Jazz, this is a big one. Nice to see you, Chuck. The pleasure is all mine. And if you have a question for Dr. Jazz, go ahead and post that in the comment section. Now we will be opening up the doctor's mailbag in just a little bit. You can also tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room live. But first, let's get caught up on the latest happenings. Here are your health headlines for Tuesday, October 13th, 2020. It has been a busy 72 hours on the coronavirus front with seven states setting single day records for cases and the national average climbing 12% higher over the last week. That climb far steeper in some parts of the country. In the last week, caseloads in South Dakota have spiked 50%, in New Mexico, 52%, while in Montana, an alarming 63%. Dr. Anthony Fauci telling CNBC the country is in a bad place heading into the cold winter season. Meanwhile, health officials are attributing at least part of the surge to smaller gatherings inside homes where friends and family are getting together without wearing masks or practicing social distancing. Meanwhile, a 25-year-old Nevada man has become the first patient confirmed in the U.S. to have contracted the coronavirus twice. The man, who had no known underlying conditions, first became sick in April, then recovered before testing positive for a second time in June with what doctors believe is a different strain of the virus. A case study published in The Lancet reveals the second infection was more severe, landing the man in the hospital with a myriad of symptoms, including fever, dizziness, nausea, and shortness of breath. He has since recovered, something to keep a close eye on as vaccine development continues. And finally, oh boy, a new study is finding that the coronavirus can live on certain surfaces and remain infectious for up to four weeks. And it appears that your cell phone is one of those surfaces. Researchers in Australia say the virus also survives well on other smooth surfaces, such as glass and steel, at a temperature of 68 degrees. But if the temperature rises to 86 degrees, the virus can only survive for about a week, and at 104 degrees, it lasts only about a day. As for clothing, materials such as cotton, it can last anywhere from two weeks to less than a day, depending on temperature. All right, let's move on. Main event time here on the exam room live. When I was morbidly obese and 420 pounds, I've talked about this time and again, I was addicted to food. Downloading my daily dose of fast food, I could really feel just this warm, calm rush over me with every bite. And that I thought was my brain's way of saying thank you for rewarding me with such delicious high fat content. The brain in fact is wired to react to food like that. And the reward circuitry it has can mean the battle of the bulge can turn into a life and death struggle to kick that junk food habit. But a new study is going in depth on that reward circuitry of the brain and how a plant-based diet can be the secret weapon that can help you win that fight. Dr. Hanna Kaliova is one of the lead researchers of that study, and she is here with us today. Dr. Kaliova, thank you so very much for taking the time. Thank you, Chuck. And it's my pleasure uh, to share with you uh, the, the research that we have just published on Friday. Uh, let me share my screen. This is this is a really big one. I know that specifically this research is looking at uh, people who have diabetes and are obese, but I think, you know, by and large, everybody is familiar with how that brain reacts when they bite into something good. Absolutely. 
and how can we break the addiction, right? Like we don't want to be addicted to anything. We want to be free people. But how to break the addiction? The food addiction seems to be one of the hardest to break. Many people stop smoking, but they go to food to, uh, you know, form a new addiction. Oh, uh, yes. How, oh, can yes. We, how can we break this cycle? Um, well, to answer this question, we conducted a crossover study where we gave 60 men um, a plant-based meal and a, a usual meat-containing sandwich. And we were looking at the reward circuitry in the brain. And we were looking at other reactions to these meals. Um, to give you a little bit of background, when we eat a meal, it's really satisfying. And it's because our reward circuits are being um, lit up like this. The warmer the colors, the more blood flow. So when we eat a meal, uh, red is the most blood flow that's going to the brain. Uh, and uh, when we eat a meal, the reason why we're so satisfied is because our uh, reward circuits in the brain are being activated. Uh, and normally, when we eat a meal, the reward circuits light, light up like this. Uh, unfortunately, in addictions, like for example, cocaine addiction, um, the colors are not as bright. They're more in the green zone, so not as activated as the red ones and the yellow ones. And uh, interestingly, uh, in obese people, uh, it's a very similar finding to those who are addicted. So this suggests that obesity is just another addiction to food, that obese people are trying to override uh, the lower uh, activation of their reward circuits in the brain by eating more food and more rewarding food like high fat and sugary foods. Uh, an interesting study was comparing an effect of high versus low glycemic index foods on the brain reward circuits. And you may recall that a high glycemic index food that might be, for example, sugar, which makes a big spike of blood sugar uh, in, your, in, your, in your blood. And uh, then uh, it also goes down pretty sharply. Uh, causing much, much more hunger than eating, for example, brown rice, which would be a low glycemic index food. And the researchers found out that the high glycemic index food, like for example, sugar, uh, activated the reward circuits late after eating the meal. And this was also associated with increased feelings of hunger after the high glycemic index food. And, uh, this study really inspired us uh, to look at the reward circuits in the brain more closely, particularly at the thalamus perfusion. Uh, in our brain, we have two main pathways associated with meal intake. Dopamine pathways that are uh, associated with reward and pleasure and euphoria, but are also involved in mo motor function and also uh, in perseveration. Uh, serotonin pathways are more involved in mood and memory and processing and also cognitive functions. And thalamus is right, is involved in both. So it's, it's definitely a part of the reward circuit, but it's also important for the cognitive functions. And, uh, we took 20 healthy men, 20 uh, men who were overweight or obese, but ha had normal glycemic uh, um, profile, and 20 men with type 2 diabetes. All these men were, were at age um, matched, and the overweight uh, and men with type 2 diabetes were uh, also body mass index matched. And we gave them uh, two meals in a random order. One was a vegan meal, uh, a vegan sandwich, and one was just like a regular uh, meat-containing meal. Uh, 
uh, and both had the same amount of energy, uh, but they had different reactions to the intake of the meal. While the healthy men uh, experienced a marked decrease in, in the thalamus perfusion after the vegan meal, uh, this response was completely blunted in the over, overweight and uh, men with di diabetes. So if we just compare the groups, uh, the subtraction of the vegan minus uh, the meat containing meal uh, would be a decrease in, in, in healthy men. But this response was completely blunted in the overweight and men with type 2 diabetes. Now, uh, what's interesting that after the vegan meal, all men across all groups uh, reported more satiety. They're, they were more satiated after the vegan meal. Uh, and uh, interestingly, also the GLP-1 secretion was higher after the vegan meal in men with type 2 diabetes and in healthy men. And GLP-1 is one of the incretins secreted in our gut in response to meal intake, which stimulates uh, insulin secretion, but also stimulates the reward circuits in our brain. And we have shown um, that the changes in satiety and also changes in GLP-1 were associated with the changes in the reward circuit in the brain, in thalamus perfusion. So to summarize the findings, the responsiveness of the reward circuitry in the brain is reduced in obesity and type 2 diabetes. Um, the vegan meal reduced activation of the reward circuitry in healthy men uh, late after the meal intake, which was a positive finding. And these changes were also associated with uh, changes in satiety. After the vegan meal, uh, the decrease in thalamus perfusion was associated with less of a steeper decline in satiety. Uh, so this is a completely positive finding. The more the thalamus perfusion decreased, the less satiety decreased um, a few hours after the meal. So that's something that we would like to see also in the obese and type 2 diabetes men. Uh, and all men reported greater satiety after the vegan meal. Um, these changes were uh, associated with changes in thalamus perfusion. And also uh, a huge finding of the study is the increased GLP-1 secretion after the vegan meal. Um, and GLP-1 is one of the incretins that not only stimulates insulin secretion, um, but also is responsible for satiety and activating the reward circuits. Uh, so I'd like to encourage all of you to um, increase the thalamus perfusion in your brain, brain in, your, in a natural way uh, by eating plant foods. Uh, you can increase your satiety um, because plant-based foods contain a lot of fiber. That, that will make you satiated, will also increase um, the secretion of GLP-1, which will activate your brain in the right proportion, not too much. Um, and uh, with this, I'd like to uh, send it back to Chuck. All right. Uh, a couple of follow-ups here. So it's my understanding that the, the plant-based meal kind of blunted the reward circuitry a little bit. Is that what I'm understanding here? So in healthy men, uh, the decline in, uh, in the perfusion of thalamus was much steeper than uh, the, the response was blunted in, in men who were obese and who had type 2 diabetes. But interestingly, in all groups, men reported a greater satiety and there was also increased response to GLP-1 secretion, uh, which is a molecule that directly is involved in stimulating the brain circuits. So it seems like in, in men who are obese and have diabetes, uh, it, one sandwich might not be enough to show the difference in, in the perfusion of thalamus in the brain. But definitely all the other components are there. So it seems like if 
if these men will just continue eating plant-based meals, they might be able to renew the sensitivity of the brain to the, to the natural effects of, of plant-based foods. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I'm wondering if that high fiber meal, because it is plant based, if that would kind of offset that reward circuitry. Like I'm just thinking back to my own experience, right? So you go to a fast food place and the food you're going to get there is not exactly filled with fiber. So I'm wondering in my case, yeah, if, if that was a high fiber meal that I was gorging on at the time, would I have eaten less? And from what it is that you're showing here with this study, the answer is absolutely, mm. I would have eaten less. And so did the gentleman in your study. Absolutely. Yeah. Part, the fiber is one of, one of the mechanisms how, uh, how the food works on the reward circuitry. That was the previous study showing that if we eat um, a meal with the same amount of energy that's high in, low gly in glycemic index, which would be, for example, sugar, some, some sugary foods, um, then we will be activating uh, the, the reward circuits too much uh, compared to the same amount of energy in low glycemic foods, such as brown rice or whole wheat pasta. And, and can you elaborate a little bit more on that connection between insulin secretion and reward circuitry, kind of fill in some gaps there for us? Absolutely. So insulin secretion um, is um, disrupted in people with type 2 diabetes. And it has been shown that also the brain uh, plays a role because there's uh, also central insulin resistance in the brain. And so this is something we need to break uh, through the diet and lifestyle as well. Uh, and there's one fascinating study that I would like to share with you. For example, uh, when researchers were giving people ice cream, uh, in the first few days, um, the reward circuits were really lighting up. Uh, and, you know, people were getting so much reward from eating ice cream. But when people were eating the ice cream every day, this response was completely blunted. So in other words, they developed tolerance. Uh, you know, they were not responding to the ice cream the way they were before. Uh, so they had to eat more of it. They had to eat it more often. And obviously this led to overeating. And that's exactly what happens in obesity and type 2 diabetes. And the way out uh, is just to change the signal, uh, you know, switch the foods to more natural foods that will activate the, the reward circuitry in a more natural way, in a more balanced way, uh, you know, promoting satiety, uh, promoting GL, GLP-1 secretion, which will, uh, which will activate these reward circuits, um, not too much, but in a, in a healthy way. So help me, you are one of the smartest people I have ever met in my entire life. It is honestly a privilege every single time you come on this show because you bring the science and you bring it strong. So thank you so very much, Dr. Kaliova. Thank you so much, Jack. My pleasure. All right. We'll talk to you again soon. Fascinating study. I love those brain scans. Isn't that interesting stuff? Okay. So now let's. Uh, now that we've got the science, let's talk about you. Let's talk about putting it into action. If you are a junk food junkie or just can't cut candy out of your life, what can you do to correct these habits? We just heard about the benefits of a plant-based diet. Well, with some more practical tips and advice, let's welcome Dr. Jazz, Dr. Jasbel Sardana to the exam room live. Dr. Jazz, you have seven tips for doing this for us today. I do. All right. What is tip number one? Let's dive right in. Let's go. Um, so number one is you have to know your triggers. You know, I think we've all struggled with overeating at some point in our lives. Um, but number one is being aware. What are those foods that are in your pantry, that are in your fridge, that you go out for, or now more often ordering in, um, that are your triggers? Until you know what those are, you're not going to be able to avoid them. And so say you have some triggers or you're living with um, another person, you're not living alone. And there are foods that they are eating that could potentially be your triggers. So this is where it's really important to have a conversation with those who are who you're living with. Um, if those foods happen to be a trigger for you, 
you know, talk to them about storing them somewhere else where you might not know where that is. So number one, the most important thing is knowing your triggers, removing them as needed. Uh, you know, there's a there's a phrase I use with my patients, which is if the devil doesn't live in your fridge, if the devil doesn't live in your pantry, he can't tempt you. And what all that really means is if you can take away that temptation, if you can take away that fight, that constant fight, the more successful you'll be. So that's number one. All right. Tip one down. We've got six to go. That's a pretty good one. And I I, I will tell you, uh, if you do have a question for Dr. Jazz, go ahead and post that in the comment section. Now, I see a lot of great ones already coming in. So we'll uh, keep keep filling up that mailbag as she keeps going with the tips. Dr. Jazz, what's number two? Number two. So I don't believe in cheat days, Chuck. You no, know? neither do I. No, neither so do I. I don't believe in cheat days. Um, I don't believe in cheating at any, like at any point. <laughs> For right any on. Right. So I don't believe in cheat days. I do believe in treat days and I believe in planned treat days. And I think oftentimes with overeating, um, we get into a space where we see something that we really want and we haven't planned ahead for when we might have that again. And so we dive right in and we we go overboard. So if you've planned ahead and and, it, and this doesn't have to mean that every single meal is planned out to the T, but just having an idea of, oh, you know what? I know at the end of the month, uh, there's a birthday that we're going to celebrate. And I'm going to, you know, make that delicious vegan brownie recipe that not so healthy, but still, um, you know, treat for myself. If you plan ahead for those treat days, less likely that you're going to overindulge and overeat on the days that are not treat days. Gotcha. Okay. So, okay. Before we go to number three, so here, I think that's can be a slippery slope for a lot of people. And I, it can. I, I wonder, that. are there certain people that you would say, okay, let's not have a treat day at all because it is kind of like tempting an alcoholic to have that drink? Great, great question, Chuck. So you have to also know yourself a bit. There are some people who can have, there are some people who can have these um, treats in their home and they're great with it. However, for me, if you're like me, there's certain things I just can't have in my house. There's certain treats that I, no matter how much of a treat it is or how much I'm looking forward to it, I just can't have it. You make up, you make such a great point. So if you are someone who knows that this could potentially be a slippery slope, this is something that you probably want to avoid. All right. Tip number three, what do you have? So portioning out your food. You know, we overeat because all the food's in front of us. And so if it's in front of us, we're probably going to eat more than we want. So there's lots of tricks to do that. Number one, if you happen to be eating out or you're ordering from somewhere else, um, you know, the entree portion that restaurants provide, number one, the food is probably going to have a lot more fat and salt and sugar than if you would, um, <clears throat> than if you were preparing it at home. So number one, my tip is cook at home. But if you happen to be eating out, knowing that those types of foods are probably going to have more uh, salt, sugar, fat, etc. When you get your food, divide it in half, divide it into a third, put the rest away. Just eat the portion that you've portioned out for yourself. And then if you still feel hungry, go back for seconds. But don't feel like just because something's been served to you or you've ordered it in this portion that that's what you have to eat. It's been said a lot uh, on this show, and and this was some of the advice that I got when I was losing weight too. It's if you go out to eat, get that to go box when you place that order, and just yes. automatically dump half of that plate right into the to go box, and you're you're good to go. Absolutely, and also when you're eating at home, never eat. Not that you should be eating a ton of things out of a bag or a box, but don't ever eat out of a bag. Don't ever eat out of a box. If there's something that you want to eat, put it onto a plate. Um, and the other trick I personally use is using a smaller plate for my portions. Um, always, I, I never bring out the big plate unless it's a, you know a platter or something I'm doing. But I eat off of a smaller plate, and I'm I'm very satisfied. You are speaking to my soul. It's these little tips that make all yeah. the difference. I'm so excited by this. What's the <laughs> next one? So this is something that Dr. I'm just going to, you know, um, uh, support what Dr. Kaliova mentioned, which is to eat your fiber. She talked a lot about increasing GLP-1, which leads to greater satiety. It, on a whole food plant-based diet, that's where the bulk of your fiber is coming from. There's no fiber in meat. There's no fiber in dairy. All of your fiber is in whole foods and plants. If you get a ton of that, if that's what you're eating, that's naturally going to improve your satiety and you're naturally going to eat less. 
And also as a bonus, if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, if you do happen to eat a little bit more, you're eating a little bit more of the good stuff. Yeah, that's an, yeah, you know, and somebody who I was speaking with recently who also lost a lot of weight said, you know, overeating is definitely something that I still struggle with to this day. But the difference is I'm not eating these high fat, high calorie yeah. foods anymore. So it's not quite the devil that it once was. That's exactly right. All right. What's the next one, Dr. Jazz? So we... As a society, I think because we're doing multiple things all at once, um, we're super multitasking. When was the last time you ate a meal without your phone, without looking at your phone, without talking to somebody, without reading a newspaper or an article or being distracted in some kind of way? So the next step, next tip is to eat um, slower without these distractions. So what we know is that there was a study in 2015, they looked at two groups of individuals and they both gave them this beautiful bowl of tomato soup, about 400 mLs, um, a cup and a half roughly of tomato soup. And they looked at the group that ate that soup slower versus the ones that ate it really fast. And what they found is the, the group that ate the soup slower felt fuller and then several um, hours later after they recalled eating that food, they thought it was you know, a substantial portion versus the, the group that ate it a lot faster did not feel as full. So taking your time with eating. When Dr. Kaliova mentioned those hormones, um, you know, she likened that link or she you know, spoke about the link between our brain and our gut. When you eat, you're actively physically stretching out the uh, your stomach. And as you're doing that, the vagus nerve, which is the longest nerve in our body, connects our brain stem to our gut and, and further uh, gets activated. It goes sends feedback uh, back up to our brain. And hormones are released to tell our body that we are satiated or that we're still hungry. And that takes about 5 to 20 minutes. If you're scarfing down your food, what's going, what's going to happen is that you're not giving your body enough time to realize that it's full. So eating slowly is tip number five. Something else that I've heard of is people actually counting the number of times that they chew their chew. food. Is that something that you've spoken with patients about? I have, um, you know, taking for, for lots of reasons, it's really, really actually a good thing to chew your food fully and to take your time uh, while you're doing it. And it is a neat trick. If you can do that consistently taking a hundred um, bites, sometimes it depends on the amount of bites uh, or the food that you're eating, but slowing down and counting your bites is a great tip to help you slow. 100. You are mashing that into the next, you know, millennium. Exactly. Holy cow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> hey, you'll be finished with breakfast tomorrow. Oh my God. That's right. uh, I love it so much. I believe, uh, what are we up to? Tip number six now? Tip number six. Um, I kind of, you know, I, I spoke on this a little bit with eating slowly because it goes hand in hand, but eating mindfully, Chuck, you know, when was the last time when you sat down to eat, um, you know, asking our viewers, that you actually tasted your food. I mean, really tasted the food, that you noticed the texture, uh, that you noticed the smells, and that you noticed the flavor profile of the food that you're eating. Oftentimes we're not just eating plain rice or plain beans, there's lots of flavors and herbs and, and things in it. So taking this time and the chance to sit and to eat really mindfully. I mean, I give the viewers a, a homework assignment. You can do this with one of two things. Number one, when you go home, or when I guess everyone's at home, but when you're when you have a chance next, take a piece of bread, whole grain bread, um, sprouted, whatever it is that you like to eat that's healthy. Take a piece and put it in your mouth and don't chew it. So just take that piece of bread, let it sit in your mouth, and you'll notice over the course of you know a few seconds, a minute or two, it's going to slowly dissolve as the amylase, the enzymes in your mouth, start the digestion process, and pretty soon it's going to taste like candy all of the sweetness comes out. So that analogy is exactly what I would say when it comes to eating mindfully. When you are sitting down without distractions, without speaking, you actually enjoy your food more. And as you do that, uh, you're more likely to eat less. And the other tip to do that uh, um, experiment with or a homework with is with a, with, a, with a grape. Oftentimes when we eat grapes, we're just popping them in our mouth. But if you stop and eat one grape, at a time and pay attention to it. Oh my gosh, it is an experience. Phenomenal. So I challenge you guys. That sounds like the name of a great book, One Grape at a Time. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right, what's the seventh tip? <laughs> and then number seven is to eat before you're starving. So Chuck, here's a really important piece here. Hunger is not the same, same thing as appetite, okay? Being hungry is not the same thing as being hungry sometimes. So hunger is a physiologic, you know, biochemical uh, re reaction where your, you know, blood sugars go down. You might get a little bit irritable. Those are physical signs of being hungry. However, appetite is more, is more psychologic. It's sometimes a lot of why appetite is, you know, why our appetite grows has to do with the way that we learn to eat. So number one, knowing that your hunger is going to be different from your appetite is number one. And then getting really clear on whether you're hungry or not um, will help you to eat before you're starving. Michael Pollan, who's um, you know very well known author, had this really great tip, which is how to tell the difference between your if you're really hungry or just emotionally eating and trying to eat for another reason is to is to give yourself the apple test. If you're if you're feeling hungry, grab an apple. If you really were hungry, you would eat the apple. And if the appetite, ap the apple, it does not seem that appetizing to you, you're probably not that hungry. So that was a good tip. The apple is the litmus test. I like that. That is, yes. a, that is a very good tip. And I'll tell you something. Maybe you can speak to this one as well. Dinah uh, right now, who's watching us, one of the exam rooms uh, on YouTube, she's uh, talking about she watches the news while she eats. So I think especially oh. right now, that's kind of a gamble of <laughs> one, not mindfully eating, but two, then you definitely get into the emotional eating realm as that's well. Right. <laughs> no, absolutely. That That is probably a no go in my book. Um, definitely not the news. If you're going to watch something, maybe something a little bit more lighthearted. Um, but I agree with you, Chuck, the news would probably drive anyone to overeat. Uh, overeat, pull your hair out, you name it. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and open up that doctor's mailbag, officially answer a couple of your questions. And Dr. Jazz, I'm just going to throw a bunch of people's questions in on this one, because they're wondering about uh, being maybe addicted to healthier foods, foods like nice cream as opposed to ice cream, or just bananas in general. If you can't go a day without eating those healthier foods, is that still a problem? Does that qualify as an addiction? Oh, so healthy foods, but turned into nice cream. So not plain bananas, but just turned into treats. E either or, you know, if somebody yeah. can't go a day without eating that banana Any or they they no longer reach for briars, but instead will make nice cream right. healthy in their Vitamix. Yeah. So kudos for, you know, choosing a healthier alternative, but anything that you feel like you can't go a day without is probably not a healthy thing, you know, even if it is a healthy food, um, you know, that I know that sounds a little bit strange, but Again, as, as Dr. Kaliova mentioned earlier, we want to be free. We want to be able to, there is a freedom that comes with not being addicted to anything. So if this is something that you enjoy, it's a healthy food that you're able to enjoy in portions um, and in a frequency that's healthy, that's fine. But if you go a day and you're feeling some kind of way or your emotions are off because you didn't have it, there's something else underlying that. And it sounds like to me that you're probably just replacing one addiction with, the, uh, with another. So even though it's healthy, um, I would still be cautious. And that goes to Marsha's question. She wrote in wondering if there was a way, because the brain is so intimately involved here, is there a way to add more variety to the diet without mm -hmm. upsetting the proverbial apple cart? <laughs> Great question. Um, you know, we're creatures of habit. We enjoy eating the same things um, for the most part. And um, I think there is some, there is benefit to actually eating the same things, even if it's in different varieties, because then there's a consistency with the amounts of vitamins and minerals that you're going to get. And in a well-planned whole food plant-based diet, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're getting all those nutrients. And so being able to have things that are consistent are not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and however, Variety is really important too. We want to 100% take a look at your diet to begin with. Make sure that you're getting, you know, all the vegetables, a rainbow of your vegetables, the legumes, beans, three times a day, your whole grains, your water in. And if there is room for variety with different flavor profiles, um, eating different um, you know, dishes from different cultures. Those are ways to add in variety, but still maintaining that foundation of a whole food plant-based diet. 
All right. Would you be open to doing another show on this? We have so many questions that are still coming in that we're not going to have time to get to. And I want to make sure everybody gets their questions answered. And frankly, this is just a fascinating topic. It really is. It really is. I'd be happy to. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We will save your questions, hold them for that future episode. So go ahead and keep on posting them right now, or you can tweet them to us using that hashtag exam room live. And y'all, Listen up. This has been some really good advice. And if you are in the need of a plant-based physician, Dr. Jazz is here for you. You can make an appointment to visit with her at the Barnard Medical Center. Telemedicine appointments available in more than a quarter of the country with new states coming online all the time. So to make that appointment, head over to barnardmedical.org or pick up the phone and call 202-527-7500. And I'm sure, Dr. Jazz, these are the kinds of things that you work with your patients uh, on one-on-one. Absolutely. I think that's what's so special about what we do, Chuck, is that we have um, such a special niche in nutrition and diet because we understand the science and the benefit behind nutrition, um, behind the foods that we're eating, that we are able to have these conversations with our patients that maybe other um, offices can't. So. Ah, I love it so much. And I love the fact that you were able to take the time to join us today. Appreciate it as always. Thank you so much, Dr. Jazz. Thank you so much, Chuck. This was super fun. Awesome. We'll do it again soon. Okay. Throughout the month of October, we are banding together to beat breast cancer. Indeed, it is Let's Beat Breast Cancer Month here at the Physicians Committee. And I encourage you to head over to letsbeatbreastcancer.org. Join with us and pledge to take the four steps that we've designed that can help you lower your risk of getting breast cancer. Pledge to follow those steps. Pledge to get healthy. And just by doing that, you will be entered to win a great prize pack that has all kinds of phenomenal goodies that I assure you you will like. These are the things that are designed to get you going on your healthier journey. And I want to say a big thank you to Fruitive for supporting the Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign this year as well. Your support is most definitely appreciated. So let's beat breastcancer.org. Pledge to take those steps. Get entered for that prize pack. And oh, by the way, if that's not enough, you know what you also get? A free e-cookbook that is filled with cancer fighting recipes, all of which are also very, very delicious. Let's beat breastcancer.org is the place to go. Now, coming up on the show tomorrow, if you think you can't get all big and strong while eating a plant-based diet, well, think again, my friend. Weightlifter Ramona Cottigan, she will be here to teach us all how to build muscles like Popeye, and I'm sure it probably involves eating a lot of spinach. So she is here. She's looking to represent the U.S., one of our national athletes. She's looking to represent us in the next World Masters Games next year over in Japan. So she definitely is going to know what she's talking about. So we're going to get all pumped up when Ramona joins us on the program tomorrow. That starts at noon Eastern, right back here on Facebook and on YouTube. Dr. Neil Barnard will also be in the house as well. And I can't wrap up the show today. Uh, Director, I don't know if you can pull up full screen. Yep, there he is. That is my little pup, Rudy. He is celebrating his third birthday today. So I just wanted to say, Rudy, I love you, buddy. Thanks for being in my life. You're a good dog. I like him so much. I'm going to go give him a birthday banana. Uh, so that <laughs> look at the happy birthday message. You are on point today. Thank you. Uh, all right. As much fun as we have had today, we do have to wrap things up. So I want to say thank you one more time to Dr. Hanna Kaliova and Dr. Jasmo Sardana for their time and sharing all of everything that they know with us today. We will do it again soon. And of course, to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen, could not do it without you guys either. And thank you who is watching right now, my exam roomie, you are the reason that we do this show. On behalf of everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again tomorrow, but until then, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.